Hey guys, what's up? John from flyatmikealpha.com and we just got done talking about tack charts. So now we're going to go ahead and look at another kind of chart here. It's called a flyway chart and something you may not have heard of before, but a very awesome, helpful VFR chart for navigating around busy airports like Class Bravo airspace. So a fly chart is very similar to these tack charts. So we just looked at tack charts. We looked at all the great information they have, all this extra legend information. They have all that special use airspace information right on them. And they also even have all the tower frequencies, ground control frequencies, ATIS for all the airports that are on the tack chart. How cool is that? Well, now we're going to look at a fly chart. So a fly chart is basically, or flyway chart rather, is a planning chart for VFR pilots to be able to navigate around Class B airspace a little bit better. So what you want to do here when you're planning your VFR flight is take a look at the TAC chart, the sectional chart, and the flyway chart, all those things combined, to make your best decision as to what route you're going to fly. So it has some special information on here. Obviously, we all know about Disney World. It has this ring. Well, that's because we have a TFR in that area that's always live around Disney World. We have some unique things to the flyway chart that you don't see on the sectional chart. One of them is suggested VFR flyway in altitude. So obviously you can be below here at any altitude when you're VFR, when you're below say 2,000 feet in this area, below 4,000 feet here, below 6,000 feet here, you can be anywhere you want to be. All that's fine and dandy. But they have these depicted routes where they'd prefer for you to be. And this isn't because it's just more convenient for them or something like that. Still a lot of thought went into this. So the idea here is to keep VFR traffic and IFR traffic separate. Again, keeping airplanes from hitting each other. That's the whole idea behind airspace anyways. So we have these blue lines. And what they're saying is if you're going to be flying in this area, try to fly these blue lines and fly this route below 3,000 feet here and then fly below 2,000 feet here and then below 3,000 feet here if you want to be flying around this area. Maybe if you're coming from Orlando Popka Airport, they want you to come in, fly below 2,000 feet along this blue line, and then if you're going into Sanford International, then you could go ahead and request the Jessup arrival route into Sanford International and notice that they're wanting you to do that at 1,500 feet. We also have the same thing, similar attack charts, where we have departures for jet departures, 10,000 feet and above. We have a departure route, 10,000 feet and above here. And we have arrival routes, 15,000 to 11,000 feet, another arrival route joining up there, 10,000 to 6,000 feet, and they're getting lower as they get down towards the airport. Well, you notice how this route just kind of disappears, and then somehow or another they make their way over to Orlando International. Well, what's really happening is about this point in time, they're starting to get vectors over to the final approach course, and that's why they want you below 3,000 feet here so they can vector these guys down to as low as 4,000 feet, and even lower as they get over to the final approach course so the airliners can make a nice stable approach down to Orlando International on all these north-south runways here. They don't exactly want you flying your little airplane just right along here. Even though you can go at 1,500 feet VFR and be right on the final approach course, it might start throwing off TCAS alerts to the aircraft that are coming in descending down. And then when they get a TCAS alert, they don't see you. They might have to climb. They'll have to go around. And it's just, it wastes a bunch of fuel, wastes a bunch of time. It could put them in a bad situation since they don't want to carry enough fuel to really do more than one go around and come back around and land anyways. So that's why they really want you to fly these routes. It just helps keep things running smoothly and helps separate you from running into a big jet. And most importantly, can also help separate you from a big jet's wake turbulence when you follow these routes. So let's give an example here. Say we're coming from the Orlando Popka Airport. We're flying eastbound. We're over Lake Brantley, terrible place. I used to row there for regattas when I was in high school. Absolutely hated it. And so we're getting near Lake Brantley. We call up Orlando Approach, and we're going to call them up on the frequency list on the chart. So we don't see the actual frequency listed right here because that would just make things too busy. So we come on up here to the Monroe VFR arrival uh, corridor or the Jessup VFR arrival, and we're going to look to fly the Jessup arrival route. We're going to go ahead and contact Orlando Approach for the Jessup arrival route on 1952 if we're southeast of Sanford or 19.4 if we're southwest. So in this case, we're southwest of Sanford, and we're going to go ahead and request the arrival on 19.4. Then we're going to proceed to a point, five nautical miles, due south of Sanford, blah, blah. We're going to do this. We're going to comply with that, maintain 1,500 feet until advised by Sanford 
air traffic control tower, ATCT. So what it's going to sound like is you're flying along from Orlando Popka, you're coming up on Lake Brantley, terrible place, and you're going to go ahead and call them on 19.4, Orlando Approach, and you're going to say, hey, Orlando Approach, Cessna 12345 over Lake Brantley at 1,500, requesting the Jessup VFR arrival route into Sanford International with Tango. And you're getting the ATIS from Sanford because that's where you're planning on landing at. So they're going to come back and say, Cessna 12345, Orlando Approach, Squawk 1234, Proceed as requested. So you're going to go ahead and proceed 1,500 feet. You're going to hook up with the bridge 1,500 feet on in. You've got that two-way radio communication. You're cleared right on in to the Class Charlie Aerospace. They're happy. It shows them you know what's going on. You read back the ATIS. You told them your altitude. You told them where you are. And you told them what arrival route you're requesting. Clearly, you know what the heck's going on as a VFR pilot because you know about these arrival routes. And you check these charts before you went flying. So... Makes it nice and simple, lets them know what you are doing. Makes life easy for ATC, which makes them happy, which makes them more likely to give you the things you want. And it keeps you clear of all the other airplanes, makes it a nice, smooth, easy transition to get on in there. So a few little random questions I have for you guys, because I love trivia. Normally, we're used to seeing, hey, like around Dayton or Daytona, the airspace goes from the surface to 4,000 or 1,200 feet to 4,000 MSL. What about here? It goes from the surface to T or 700 feet MSL to T. What's T mean? That's a great question for private pilots, commercial pilots, CFIs on the oral exams. And what is SFB 400 with a line underneath it in this little box? Plus, it's got these lines through it. Why are there lines crossing out the 400 or 408? I can't even read that, whatever it's supposed to be, 408. So I'll tell you the T one. That just means that it's going from 700 feet up to the overlying terminal airspace of 3,000, and same thing here, 1,300 feet up to the overlying terminal airspace of 3,000, the Bravo airspace. But what's this 400? Go ahead and leave your answer in the comments below if you think you know it. If you don't know where to look, go ahead and check out on our pilot resources on flymikehelp.com under Ask Question Pilot Resources. Check out the Chart Legend, Chart User's Guide, and that will tell you all of that awesome information on there. It's a great 133-page document of a bunch of fancy phone symbols and defines exactly what they all mean. Super cool. So hopefully you guys found that helpful. Whatever you do, whenever you're looking at a sectional chart, a flyway chart, a tack chart, make sure you read the side panels. Great information on those side panels. Really cool stuff. Actually, just cool regulatory stuff and other helpful information. Great trivia questions on the side there. And a lot of things that DPs love to ask you about because nobody ever reads the side panel. So any questions on this stuff, leave them in the comments below. I'd be more than happy to get back to you. This is part of our bigger private pilot online ground school at flyatmikehealth.com. So if you want to learn everything there is to know about being a private pilot, commercial pilot, or CFI or anything like that, go ahead and sign up for our free online private pilot ground school at flyatmikehealth.com. Totally free. Go ahead and register for it. Awesome course you can take there and get your completion certificate at the end of it. Make sure you give us a thumbs up, like the video, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Check out our Patreon page. We greatly appreciate y'all's support. It really helps keep this a free online resource for everyone. And as always, guys, if you can't fly every day, then fly at MikeAlpha.com. We will see y'all next time.